bombs and shrapnel mean standard glass in eyepieces can create the kind of splinters which can split watermelons. Laminated glass sees action for the first time. And is it good enough for opera house windows? Well, let's put this stuff to the test in the simplest possible way. I'm going to start off where the last glass fails. The brick. Remember, this would be a tile falling from 55 metres, the height of the top sail. OK, here it goes. Three, two, one. But it didn't even bother it, did it? Felt like I was throwing bricks at somebody else's greenhouse, but it didn't even scratch. I mean, it just bounced off. This course is a lot heavier. <laughs> More than seven kilograms. I know bowling balls don't tend to fall out of the sky, but you get the picture. Three, two, one. Just as in our demonstration, Sydney's laminated glass consists of two panes separated by a layer of PVB. But they're even thicker than our test sheet. So, no worries about bowling balls falling out of the sky. Now concert goers can hold a glass in their hands without fearing glass falling on their heads. The structure of the opera house was complete. It looked good. Now engineers had to make sure it sounded good too. Concrete was never going to be suitable for the actual concert hall. The concrete shapes and the material itself are just completely unsuitable for an auditorium. Inside the shells there are tall pointy voids. The voice of even the strongest singer would have disappeared in there. Which is a bit of a problem, you might think. Even worse, concrete is acoustically harsh. It reflects sound as a mirror reflects light. The designers needed to create an interior with a completely different shape out of a completely different material. Something like wood. Its shape had to be curved to bounce sound back down. But they needed a special kind of wood. Ordinary wood wasn't light or strong enough to do the job without a huge frame to hold it in place. An ancient pharaoh's mummy pointed to the solution. Tutankhamun's tomb was discovered in 1922, along with something much more important of the Sydney Opera House. Among priceless ancient Egyptian artefacts were ingenious wooden chests. Despite the fertility brought by the mighty Nile, quality wood was in short supply. To get round this, ancient Egyptian carpenters faked the appearance of fine wood. Tutankhamun's chests were made of layers of poor wood, faced with a thin veneer of rare wood. In other words, it was plywood. Now that probably comes as a bit of a surprise, because plywood frankly has something of an image problem as workaday stuff. But it can be used for furniture, like this chair, a modern day classic. Obviously, it looked better when Christine Keeler did it. Utzon believed plywood was good for more than just furniture. He thought it could work on a huge scale to create the perfect interior for the opera house. The key to moulding the complex shapes inside the concert hall was the way plywood is constructed. Wood is much stronger in one direction than another. That's why it's easy to split along its grain, naturally goes that way. The key to plywood strength is to use different layers of wood with their grain in opposing directions. And as a result of that process, a given thickness of plywood is stronger than the same thickness of plain wood. You need less material to do the same job. It's lighter. The thing about plywood, it might look ordinary, but it's got hidden strengths. 
Let's see. I'm going to try to make something that's light and strong. And I'm going to think like an Egyptian and make it elegant as well. Plywood. This bridge has been constructed entirely from it by layering, laminating different sheets of it to form that graceful curve. But plywood isn't just about making beautiful shapes. But it is a beautiful shape. It's also surprisingly strong. Not bad, but I'm not done with this bridge yet. The bike weighs 50 kilos, and I'm another 69. Well, 70, 71. The wood bends, but it springs back effortlessly. Those ancient Egyptians knew a thing or two. The interior of the Opera House is like a separate building inside the concrete shell. You can get to places up in the roof where you can see you're between the two structures. Stagehands call this the Bombay, and that is the auditorium down there. Quite a long way down there. And it means that I'm sandwiched between the roof, the plywood shell of the auditorium down there, and the concrete shell up there. Plywood was good for the interior because it's naturally acoustically kinder than concrete and being light and strong it could make a separate shell inside the concrete sails. Best of all, as Tutankhamun's craftsmen knew, it can be shaped. The right curves mean it reflects sand back down so the audience can hear what they've paid for. So that's how you build an opera house, outside and in. Except there's just one more thing. Because, yep, it's a beautiful sculptural thing in a spectacular setting. And it's a place where concert goers, we can just escape from reality. But how do you make sure they're comfortable while they're doing it? Well, the answer lies down there. On any given night, the Opera House can host not just opera, but ballet, drama and concerts of all kinds of music. Every morning, the theatres come alive as technicians prepare the stages for the shows. They check sound and rig lights. But a perfect performance requires something else. It's a warm summer's evening on the Sydney waterfront. People can wait months for tickets, and it ought to be a beautiful night out. You come into this extraordinary building. The excitement in this room around you is palpable. You're full of expectation. You take your seat. And then, no matter how hot the performance, if there isn't good air conditioning, you're going to be in misery. A room full of thousands of people heats up very quickly. Why should we care about all of this? Other buildings manage their air conditioning needs perfectly easily without making a fuss. Well, the answer to this takes us right back to where we started. That distinctive and unique shape. The sails. This outline just wouldn't have looked the same with a chimney. Or a fan deck or cooling towers poking out of the top. Which is what large air conditioning systems usually need. So they needed a different solution. Thanks to a copper bottom sailing ship, the answer was all around them. All air conditioning systems need somewhere to get rid of the heat. If it can't go up a chimney, where does it go? Facilities manager Bob Moffat takes me underneath the Opera House to show where they find an inexhaustible supply of something to take the heat away from the Opera House. It's the water from Sydney Harbour. This is seawater. Indeed. So this presumably is, is the start of the whole thing, is it? That's right, this is the start. Um, basically, just over there, underneath, you'll see that that's the seawater intake tunnel. Yeah. Uh, it's about a metre high. It's where the water will enter into the building. And uh, the air conditioning process starts from there. I want to see how seawater can cool a theatre. Bob takes me into the bowels of the Opera House. 